All right. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm particularly happy to have some of the capital market students uh, here who see me two, on two other occasions every week. Um, but I'm you know, happy to have the chance to talk a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing recently. And the particular research I want to talk about today is on credit default swap markets. So let's start just by quickly reminding ourselves what, what do those markets do, right? Credit default swap markets are markets where you can purchase essentially insurance on debt that you may own. So imagine you own a bond on a company, you're worried that the company is going to default. If you don't want to or maybe cannot sell the bond itself, one thing you can do is you go to the CDS market and you purchase a credit default swap. You pay like something like an insurance premium every quarter. And then if default happens, this credit default swap is going to pay out to you. And it's, uh, it's, some people would say, well, it's a little bit like purchasing, say, insurance on your house or something like that. Um, you could also, even if you don't own the underlying bond, you could say, well, let me speculate in the credit default swap, and you can just take a bet, even though you're not exposed to, say, GE's debt or, you know, uh, sovereign debt from Greece, you can use a credit default swap to express a view uh, to speculate. Now, um, one thing that's true about credit default swap markets, if we look back, say, over the last 10 years or so, so credit default swap market started out kind of you know, in a, on a small scale in the late 90s, but then when you go to the early, mid 2000s, suddenly those markets have really grown tremendously and they've become very, very large and important markets, right? So from that perspective, you would think that, um, you know, if they're such important markets, we know kind of as researchers a lot about those markets. And that's not true. And the reason is that um, credit default swap markets are markets that are usually called over-the-counter markets. So dealers deal you know, with customers and all those trades uh, are over-the-counter. And historically, we've just had very little information about what goes on in credit default swap market. There was just very little data available to researchers to study what do people actually use those markets for. And so the idea um, behind this paper, or behind this research that I'm going to talk about today is to use some newly available data uh, that's going to allow us to get a little bit more of a sense for what people do in the credit default swap market. And then also what I want to get to is what the role, if you want, if you want uh, the, the economic role of the credit default swap market is. Right, so um, I'll show you in just a second what this data is, but I'm going to rely on some data that researchers up until, say, a, a few years ago did not, not have available. Um, uh, this research, uh, uh, which I'm doing with a professor at Boston University, Adam Zawadowski, is, I think, one of the first papers that tries to use this data. And we're going to start with some relatively simple questions that everybody who looks at the credit default swap market should be interested in, right? So what we're going to ask, for example, is if you look at a particular company, let's say you look at GE or you look at IBM, what determines how much of you know, that company's credit risk is transferred in the CDS market? What determines the amount of credit default swap that's written on a particular company, right? That's going to be one thing I'm going to be interested in. And then also, if we want to think about trading volume, you know, Patrick, in a different context, just talked about the fact that, they, you know, there's a lot of trading in the stock market. Also in the CDS market, there's a lot of trading. And we're going to try to figure out what determines the trading volume kind of on a monthly basis in, say, credit default swaps on a company or, or uh, anybody else, a sovereign. Right? And from, from answering those questions, and you know, let's note, right, these are very basic questions. That's kind of the first, the, those are probably the first questions you would bring to figuring out what the credit default swap market does. We then try to answer the, a broader question, which is what we're really interested in, asking, well, what is it that the credit default swap market delivers to investors that would not be possible in the absence of those markets? And I'm going to try to give you kind of at least a tentative answer at the end of my, at the end of my short presentation today. All right, so why are we able to look at something that other researchers haven't been able to look at? So there is an organization called the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. Um, and they essentially uh, run something that they call the Trade Information Warehouse for credit default swaps. And so in that Trade Information Warehouse, they record essentially every trade and every position. And they've done this for a while, but um, this used to not be available. Um, then, you know, one of the fortunate side effects of, you know, going through the whole Lehman debacle is that, well, um, a lot more information became available afterwards, including information on credit default swaps. So starting in October 2008, the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, DTCC, have started to release 
much more disaggregated data about the credit default swap market than we used to have before. Now, what can you see in this data, right? So before, all we knew you know, were essentially summary statistics, surveys of how big is this market overall. We didn't really know how much credit default swaps have been written on, say, IBM or GE. Now we can see that because what the DTCC is going to tell you every week is for the 1,000 largest reference entities, meaning the 1,000 largest either firms or sovereigns on which credit default swaps are traded, um, um, how much is outstanding in notional positions? And they give you two numbers, and I'll explain in just a second what this means. <clears throat> They'll give you one measure that's called the gross notional and one measure called the net notional. But um, roughly speaking for now, just think of this as giving us a view as to how much you know, the stock of contracts of CDS is written on, say, GE. Well, we can now look this up, and we can look at it at a weekly basis. The second thing we see is how much is traded every month. What is the trading volume, right? That's another thing I mentioned on the last slide. And so the nice thing about that is once we know trading volume for credit default swaps, we can compare that volume to trading volume in something that is in some sense similar, right? The underlying bonds, right? Because if you want to trade credit risk, you could trade a bond or a CDS. And so here we can compare and see, well, um, who trades in the bonds or why might you trade in the bond or why might you trade in the, in the CDS? All right, so let me give you one slide to explain how these positions are measured. I just mentioned these words, gross and net notional. Here is a simple example that highlights how you measure CDS positions. We'll see why you have to kind of make a choice as to how you measure them and why there are two measures. And I will then argue that the net notion, at least for us, is what we're more interested in. Let's look at this simple picture right here. This, think of these as three dealers, right? And let's say they have all entered credit default swap positions. So dealer A has sold 10 million in protection to dealer B, right? Now dealer B maybe has sold 10 million in protection to dealer C, and dealer C, 10 million to dealer A, right? And um, to highlight the difference between the gross notional and net notional, let me run through a simple example and tell you how those would be calculated here. If you calculate the gross notional, you would just add up each contract. You would say, okay, there's 10 here, 10 here, 10 here, $30 million. And this example would be the gross notional. So you end up, you add up essentially the notional value of each individual CDS uh, transaction right here. If you're interested in the net notional, then you would say, well, I still want to add contracts, but I want to take into account that here, dealer A, actually, once you net his obligations, he is not really exposed. He gets 10 million here. He has to pay 10 million here if default occurs. And in fact, in this example, which really is stark in the sense that it, it really highlights the difference between the gross net notional, you can see that each of those three dealers has you know, 10 million coming in and out if a default happens. And so the net notional position here would actually be zero. Think about it this way. When the default happens here, no money actually has to change hands. They'll all realize, oh, 10 million in and out on net, we don't have to make any payments. So the net notional measures, broadly speaking, how much money has to change hands when a default occurs. And that's really what we're interested in. I made it zero in this example, but imagine this last 10 million arrow is not here. Then the net notional would be 10, because ultimately, if you imagine this arrow is not here, 10 million would travel from A via B to C. So 10 million changes hands. And that really captures how much credit risk has been transferred, because right, that captures how much in the default event, what's the payment that's actually going to have to be made. All right, once you measure the CDS market according to net notional, right, you can look, and our data starts kind of a after the peak in the size of the market. That's why it's trending down a little bit. But you can see this market you know, is, a, is a big big market, around or more than you're starting at $1.6 uh, tr trillion dollars right here, and then trending down slowly over the last few, last few uh, years. And this dashed line, that's, those are all the 1,000 largest entities that, that we have data on. Right? And then in our study, what we do is we want to find out some other information about those companies so we can figure out, well, what drives, how much they have. And of course, you can't match everybody. Some of those you know, uh, uh, companies we don't have good other data on. But in the end, there's a sizable you know, number of companies um, that, we can, that we can match to other data. And then we can figure out, well, for those guys, what drives the CDS positions that we observe. Trading, let me show you one other graph, which I think is interesting. Um, CDS trading data is available from 2010. 
uh, CDS trading volume is the uh, solid red line here. And there, what we can do is we can compare it to bond trading volume, either in the companies that are traded in the CDS market, right? Bond trading volume, we have a longer time series. The ones, the companies that have a CDS are the dashed red line right here. You can see comparable to what they trade in the CDS. And then companies that don't have a CDS, you can see bond trading is, you know, those are on average smaller companies is, is lower. All right, so, so let's, let's uh, kind of look at what we can find. You know, once, once you have this data in place and you want to start asking some simple questions, uh, what can you say about the CDS market? And the first thing we do, in some sense, a simple first step is to say, well, the three main motives for trade in a derivative market like the CDS market could be people want to hedge. This was my initial example when I started this talk, right? People might want to take a speculative bet, right? We also mentioned that at the beginning. And then one thing I haven't discussed about yet, but that, you know, if you're in my capital markets class, we talk about a lot. People might want to arbitrage if the bond and the CDS are priced differently than maybe you want to put on a trade. In practice, people call that a basis trade, where you essentially put an arbitrage trade uh, betting that, that uh, 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 the two prices have to converge to some no arbitrage uh, connection. And so what we show in the paper kind of as a first step is that all of those three motives for trade seem to be present in the CDS market. Companies with more insurable interest, meaning more bonds uh, that they have issued, more bonds that you might want to insure, have larger net CDS positions. Uh, companies where uh, there is more disagreement about the company's earnings prospect, there is more kind of a, a desire to put on speculative bets, tend to have larger CDS positions. And then also companies where this measured deviation of CDS prices relative to bond prices, the CDS bond basis is large. Those companies, you know, highlighting this arbitrage channel also tend to have larger CDS positions, right? And that might, that probably goes along with what we would think um, uh, uh, the CDS market should serve kind of as a, as a role. Now, in terms of trading volume, there's something interesting that we, uh, that we didn't necessarily expect is if we want to look at hedging and speculation and how they relate to trading volume, one interesting pattern is that the hedging trades seem to show up in both markets, at least as much as we can identify them, but the speculative trade seems to concentrate, at least in our data, very much so in the CDS market. So those people who just want to take a bet, maybe a short-term bet, tend to do it in the CDS market. Now, that's, I think, all you know, very informative, and it also, I think, corresponds to um, uh, some of the intuitions that we might have going into a study like this. But ultimately, uh, what we really want to answer in this study, or at least where we want to make some headway, is, well, why do people, you know, we can see people might want to hedge or speculate, but why do it in the credit default swap? You can hedge by selling the bond. You can speculate by taking a position in the bond. And let me show you, and this is not from our study, this is from a recent uh, 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 BlackRock research report, but I think it makes the last point I want to make today uh, uh, very nicely, and then I'll show you how this relates to our results. Um, this shows you, I think, one of the big differences between stocks and bonds, but also between a standardized CDS and, and bonds. Um, and you can just focus on this, um, this column right here. So these, are, these companies are, you know, the biggest... Uh, uh, some of the biggest bond issuers, right? Top U.S. investment grade bond issuers. And what you see, when you just look at this uh, 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 middle column right here, you can see they have a whole bunch of different bond issues outstanding. And those bond issues usually differ in maturity and other bells and whistles. Uh, bonds are really very heterogeneous. It's a very kind of fragmented market. They all have one, you know, common equity, and usually they also have one CDS. Sometimes two, but most of the time one. And so our intuition is, well, that this should, this might be a first order reason why people like the credit default swap market, just because the bond market is so fragmented. How do you look at that when you have data like we do, right? So you want to somehow capture this fragmentation. And so essentially what we do in a little, in a little example here is we'll imagine, say, two companies one, both have issued a billion dollars in bonds, but firm A here has issued all of them as part of one, say, homogeneous bond issue, and firm B, five bond issues, overall also a billion dollars, but each of these issues are 200 million. So this firm has a you know, more fragmented bond market in the sense that they've issued also a billion in bonds, but they have, um, they have cut this up into five different issues. 
This is something that you can measure. You know, in, in economics, people who study industry concentration, for example, use something called an Herfindahl index. That's a measure of such fragmentation. So we're going to do the same thing here, and we're going to calculate for each company, well, how fragmented or not fragmented are their bonds. And the, the interesting thing that we find is that, well, once you do that, and once you control for a whole bunch of other stuff, then you do find that those firms whose bonds are more fragmented and uh, you know, if we want to put a little bit more interpretation to it, more non-standardized in the sense that each issue is slightly different from the other, well, those firms tend to be the firms where we see more CDSs outstanding and also where we see more trading volume in the CDS contract. Now, why might that be? Well, um, what, we, what we can then do is we can ask, uh, well, what does this fragmentation do to the bonds that leads people into the CDS market? And I want to argue that one of the channels, at least, is something that we would call liquidity, meaning um, those non-standard fragmented bonds might be expensive to trade. Um, the CDS, which is much more standardized, is relatively inexpensive to trade, right? So it's easier for you to get in and out of positions. Um, how, how, how can we find some evidence for that? Well, what we look at is, let's take the firms where the bonds are fragmented, fragmented into a bunch of separate issues and just ask, if we look at standard measures of liquidity, for example, how expensive is it to trade the bonds? You can calculate that by looking at transaction data on bonds. Or how much trading is there in the bond? Then what we find is that precisely those companies that have a lot of CDS and have, uh, have fragmented bonds, well, those firms, if you look at their bonds, those bonds are usually expensive to trade, so the trading costs are indeed high, and there's not a lot of turnover. And that, that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> is, in some ways, I think, is, uh, tells us that the channel through which the standardization of the CDS helps the bond market is that, well, when the bond market is fragmented, then the standardized contract can step in, kind of as an, I call it, or we call it in the paper, an alternative trading venue that traders can use, particularly in those cases where the underlying security is, is not standardized. And that's different, right? If we think about equity options, like an option on a stock, well, usually, as we said earlier, there's one stock and then an option, so probably there what goes on is something different. But when we think about the CDS market, then the non-standardized nature of bonds and the standardized nature of CDSs is, is probably a first order thing we want to think about when we look at those markets. All right, so I'm going to conclude. Um, this study um, was possible because over the last few years we've had as researchers new data that allows us to study markets that we weren't really able to study as much before. Um, what we're interested in here is the credit default swap market and um, you know we Find evidence, first of all, for the trading motives that you may have in mind when you think about, well, what, what might investors want to do in the CDS market? They, well, they may hedge, they may take speculative bets, or they might want to do cross-market arbitrage trades between the bond and the CDS. But then on top of that, uh, uh, our data, I think, highlights this interesting kind of standardization role of the CDS market that, that tells us that, well, particularly for those firms where the bonds are fragmented into a number of separate issues, the CDS market can step in. This last thing actually ties in into a current debate. If you follow bond markets and you follow you know, the research that, say, companies like BlackRock produce, there's been a lot of debate about should we make bonds more standardized or are we happy with the way the bond market functions right now? And so one, one argument uh, uh, that you may uh, uh, want to uh, think about when you look at our evidence is that, well, it's not necessarily the case that you have to standardize, standardize the bond issues if you are willing to have on the side a more standardized market opening up, the CDS market, which can have some of the standardization that you don't have, have in the bond market. Um, okay, thanks very much.